Uh, thank you to the organizers, as always. This is always a great venue, and I appreciate everybody staying until the end of the day. Today, I'm going to talk about deep style uh, mineralization Olympic Dam from the macro, from the micro to the macro scale. Even though my name's listed on here, uh, it's a lot of work built on a lot of years from colleagues no longer working Olympic Dam to a mass now, and our associations with the University of Adelaide and and the University of Tasmania. The first little image that we see here is a, a reflective light microscope image about, sorry, I have to stand for a minute, about 20 millimeters across, and we see calcopyrite in yellow and normal hemat mixed up hematite, magnetite in a typical breccia. So deep mineralization, we're gonna talk about what that means. And if we look at this 4A derived vertical gravity image over on, on the left-hand side, the kind of yellow area in yellow and up to the brighter spots, that sort of mimics our, our resource outline. But I have a couple important um, image, uh, sorry, drill hole locations sh shown on there. Sorry, I should have said the square is the, about one kilometer beyond our um, special mining lease. Thanks. Yep, one kilometer beyond our, beyond our special mining lease, so it gives you an idea of scale. And that big black bar at the bottom, which is not visible, is or not very visible, is five kilometers. RD1, the discovery hole, RD10, um, which was the one of roughly 200, 200 meters at 2% copper. RD1988, which is one of our deeps hole, RD2786A. 2488 is, a, is our best example of a fresh Roxby Downs granite, even though that still does have signs of alteration. And RD2773, which was, um, it's the deepest, uh, extent, vertical extent down of the ore body that we've drilled to date. But the talk today is about, about the um, deep mineralization. And, and in about 2005, when the big expansion project was on, we had questions to ask and, you know, where are the deeper extents of the ore body which we believe that were there? Uh, so we used a, a missing mass model to create, to look at the difference between what the, what the gravity image, sorry, what the gravity data was telling us, and then also um, to compare that with our measured bulk density. So look at all the measured bulk density across the deposit. We, add, we do bulk density on every single assayed sample, and at that time there were about a million of them, and look for the difference where there might be a gap. And, and that area that was where the gap is, where 1988 is now, um, was actually targeted, and RD 1988 was a subvertical hole that went in in 2006 and stopped it at about 19, uh, 1898 meters. It ended in 1.6 percent copper, 1.2 grams per ton of gold, 250 ppm uranium. There was a thousand meters of one point on average of 1.5 percent copper, one gram per ton of gold, and 270 ppm. And you can break those things down further, but it was still a significant uh, thickness of mineralization. And you say, well, why don't we drill a lot more? It was very deep. Think about that 1,800 meter depth at the standard of the day in 2006. And besides that, we also had a, a multi-billion ton resource that sits several hundred meters above that. However, we drilled already what was called 2785 and 2786. And those two drill holes were located about 300 meters apart. And they were directionally drilled uh, early in 2007 to actually understand what that true width of that mineralization might be that was intersected, that where we intersected with that subvertical hole in a subvertically oriented ore body. So we recognize there, there could be some false images of what was going on. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the uh, Besides the copper mineralization, a lot of the other things that we found from looking at RD2786A and, and then address why are we even thinking about that now. So the deep style of mineralization, for those that have been to these presentations before, a, a map of Olympic Dam at about 350 meters beneath the surface, fresh Roxby Downs granite going from the edge towards the center of the deposit. The grays represent various increasing amount of iron in the deposit. The colored areas represent our bedded clastic facies that occur inside and more shallower in the deposit. And we can see the little yellow bar off on the southeastern corner with that orange bar that shows where our, our cross section is going to be. 
we look at this um, pseudo cross section and the pseudo cross section going from south uh, west to, to um, northeast, and notice the vertical depth down there. Um, the, those again, those colors represent the various bedded clastic facies and what we think are rocks derived from that. Other lines that are important are bornite calcosite, which is that red line that's going across where we can see it pretty well um, on the gray background. And then we go down to our classic zonation, calcopyrite bornite, and then calcosite, uh, sorry, pyrite calcopyrite. So I just want to turn my face away from here for a minute, sorry. If I get this right, ooh, forbid. There we go. Okay. Uh, over here, already 1988, significant mineralization started about here, so minus 1,100 meters RL, and down to the end of the hole. And then RD 2786A, which is this long hole here, drilled out to that spot. But the main thing was to intersect this just to get an idea what was happening. Now, what, is, what does some of the mineralization look like in, in RD 2786A? One of the shallowest... Oh, sorry. Just help going back here. Uh, the, sh the shallowest part here is this, what we just called our KMQ, which just means a, a laminated uh, hematite quartz sandstone, mudstones, and, and siltstones. Typically unmineralized, but they can be mineralized. And we see the, the downhole depths on here, you know, from there to there. Uh, more classic hematite breaches that sit vertically below that. And then down at the bottom of the hole, or very near the bottom of the hole, still hematite-rich breaches, but with class still left of, of this material that was up shallower. So we had to think back at that time uh, on how could you get something that was near surface way down at plus 1,500 meters depth, but very kind of typical looking rock for, for the deep mineralization. Look at some chemical profiles. And these chemical profiles just show uh, copper going downhole, Copper, uh, magnetic susceptibility, which we measure on, on all of our drill holes and by handheld measurements, not downhole. Uh, bulk dry density, iron, and, and a potassium alumina ratio. Looking at that copper profile, it kind of background sort of noise, and about 900 meters, everything is kicking up to you know above one weight percent copper. The mag sus just gradually goes up, and for us, that's still not significantly high but it's still slightly elevated, which is just more magnetite with depth, and we know that there's more magnetite at depth at the Olympic Dam that gets later overprinted by hematite. The bulk dry density uh, bounces around, you know, from, from three grams per cubic centimeter up in the shallower parts down to about 3.5, 3.7 down in the deeper parts. Iron, as we always know, very well mirrors what the density is doing and likewise back and forth. So we know what that residual gravity anomaly is actually telling us. The potassium alumina ratio is a really interesting thing. And, and the little dotted red line that we see on there or the dotted orange line is actually at 0 0.5. And to the right of that is rocks that are dominated by um, sericite or muscovite plus K feldspar. And to the left of that are, are the sericite chlorite. And we can see, in general, this area is unusual for the deposit because usually we don't have K feldspar preserved in most of the, our hematite breaches. But this, this thing actually has a, a fair amount of K feldspar still, still surviving in it. Go on to the next set of things, and I, we won't go through too many millions of these on you. Uh, copper, gold, barium, molybdenum, antimony, and arsenic. Profiles down hole, so the copper we see, the gold is quite interesting. Everything's starting to jump at about roughly that 900 meters depth. Um, um, barium, and barium occurs as barite. Molly, molly occurs as rarely as molybdenum sulfide, but most of the time it occurs as, as molybdenum inside of the hematite. A lot is the same thing with antimony and the same thing with arsenic. So in these IOCG rich systems, Elements that we think would be classic sulfide minerals actually aren't. They're actually, um, they're as oxides instead of sulfides. Now, other things that are important on here is, again, the orange dotted vertical lines for barium. The typical thing in most, most, most of the ore zones are, are you know, kind of 2% barium. 
And it's important to realize that, that barite, we have a zonation of barite from the center part of the deposit going out and in most of the mineral, mineralized zone, then you're fluorite dominated. And then we're out, when we're out on the edges or at depth in the deposit where you have carbonate that's typically around with pyrite and calcopyrite. So there's a lot of barite in, the, in these areas where we really wouldn't expect it. Molybdenum does a significant kick, and for those who know about moly enrichment, four to 800 ppm is starting to look very interesting. My claim to fame a long time ago, I was going to make moly our fourth revenue or fifth revenue metal. I wasn't successful because moly does not occur as a sulfide. It occurs dominantly as an oxide. Um, antimony, you can see there's a significant enrichment in antimony in these signatures. And the same thing for arsenic. So I should be really clear. That orange dotted line represents what's typical for that ore body, for the entire ore body, except for this area around the zone, uh, around our deep mineralization. So incredibly distinct signature. Um, a lot of PhD work done on this, and particularly a previously um, a, a grant with Nigel was part of, and, and, and Christiana, and PhD works, and partially co-funded by the South Australian government too, where we've done a lot of work on that. In these areas, we also know that we have elevated um, tungsten and, and molyb sorry, tungsten and tin. So we got this molly tin tungsten signature. Keep on going down. So for RD-198, long, long ago, subvertical hole in, in a vertically oriented ore body. But now let's go back and, and start thinking about RD-27868. Again, it, it was drilled from a distance off, but trying to intersect that deeper part of RD-1988 to get an idea about the roughly the true thickness of what that mineralization might be. And and again, now for the signature that we established from 1988, that deep signature was uh, uh, really elevated barium, but moly arsenic antimony, tin tungsten, plus a little bit of other stuff. So we're going to look at 2786A now. So the first thing we'll do is just going down hole and recognize that this, this was an angled hole going down from the granites off on the, to the south of, slightly south of, of the Breccia complex. And we see background copper, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing. You're in the granites, then bang, it starts to jump up at about, you know, very roughly about 1,800 meters. Same thing with gold, same thing with barium, same thing with moly, arsenic, and antimony. A nice zone that's, you know, roughly the 150, 200 meters thick around there. And then we go back out again. At that time, we didn't really fully understand enough about, about, these, about this uh, style of mineralization at depth. We did go out of it, but probably needed to drill a little bit longer to get a, a good feel for what the background granites might look like. That's since changed. So very distinct signature. And when I, we look back at that cross section, when we have that area bounded by faults, it has proven now in the shallower parts of the d deposit where we've drilled a lot more above it, that these faults actually project all the way down and they project at depth. And the stone, the deep mineralization is clearly fault bounded which most of you would say shouldn't be any surprise. So uh, the zone of deep mineralization does have this berry, barium, moly, antimony, arsenic signature. Keep on going, going down a minute, and we're going to just look at that area around, you know, 25, 50 meters, and you say, oh, there, there's a little kick in there, or there, sorry, there's a, a little something, there's a drop in it. So we say, what was cross-cutting that mineralization? And the inside of that drill core image, and I'm not sure how well you can see it in the back, is pretty green, and it's dominated by chlorite, and it's one of our mafic ultramafic dikes. Mafic ultramafic dikes are incredibly important, or mafic ultramafic magnetism is incredibly important at Olympic Dam. Number one, it's an integral part of that ore forming system. Without that, we wouldn't have a mega breccia system, and we wouldn't have Olympic Dam. The other thing that's important is tracking these mafic, ultra, mafic ultramafic dikes. They like zone, intruding along zones of weakness, and faults are perfect areas for zones of weakness for these things to intrude upon. And recognizing faults in Olympic Dam, particularly in the shallower parts and the more northern ends of the ore body, is difficult because often they're healed and, and we just have a fault cutting a breccia, which may or may not be easy to see. So very important features to track. They can be very narrow, just from less than a meter up to you know, 20 or 30 meters wide. The color strips that we see on the side are some work that the, um, the Geological Survey of South Australia did, high logger profiles on the far right-hand side just shows the thermal infrared one, and the, the, the left-hand one is the shortwave infrared. 
The important thing is, is the oranges are the, are the feldspars, and the yellow is sericite on that uh, thermal infrared, and then the pink is quartz. And we just go down the hole and we look at that and we, and we can see that area, that zone of deep mineralization is clearly identified with that, you know, just another tool. And then that these dikes also pick up because you can identify, easily identify the chlorite. But just an additional tool that, that says that we actually have a reasonable idea what's happening with that. Shortwave infrared also, dish, sorry, the, the shortwave infrared shows subtle differences in the muscovite chemistry. So. We go back and look at this cross-section again, and the cross-section, the things that are important that we hypothesized long before we started doing this deep drilling is on the southern edges of the deposit. Um, we go very quickly from the breccia complex into granites and the granites that actually have a relatively fresh signature to it. And in big ore deposits that typically have alteration halos around them that go for kilometers outside of their mineralized area, why would we have that within less than a kilometer away from OD? And why would you have a relatively straight line where those occur? Well, lo and behold, it's a fault, not surprising. And so long ago, we just had one fault zone, but now we, we recognize that there's probably two, fault, two faults in there. Maybe, maybe not, maybe only one, but a fault zone. And, and we believe that there's probably at least two and a half to three kilometers of offset along that fault. So we call that fault, and most of our faults in the modern sense, we, we recognize the, um, all the people, our predecessors, so talk about their, their name for um, the discoverers of the deposit and other people that contributed significantly to OD with time. And so that ones are called the Woodall Fault Series over there. And, and what does the transition from the altered granites, altered and very weakly brecciated areas that are uh, depicted by just those pink crosses on there, what do they actually look like? And RD2786A and 2785, those directional holes actually gave us the best glimpse of that, trans glimpse of that transition. So even during ODX time, we were doing some sub-vertical drilling, angled faults, but directional drilling really helps you come in at a lot better angle when you want to understand systematic alteration. What we actually saw out in that, that uh, gray zone was quartz tourmaline, quartz carbonate, and quartz veins. And, and in systems where recognizing uh, or seeing veining, first of all, is pretty rare, but show me a bunch of quartz veins and I'll probably show you where the fault zone is. And, and whether that's a single fault or just a big fault zone, we don't know. Um, but there's clearly that transition and they really occur in a pretty um, airily limited extent in that area going from the breccia complex into the granites. So that, that's really interesting in itself. Let's just look at a few drill core images. So the height of those, the NQ core, so 45, or sorry, 50 millimeters high, high on the images. Uh, the upper left-hand one, the pink is the altered granites, and, and, and sorry, the pink part of the upper left-hand one is altered granite. We can see a little tiny quartz vein going through on the left upper right-hand side, and a little bit of chlorid, chloritic alteration around it. But quartz, and without looking carefully at it, we would say, ah, it's just quartz hematite. No, it's quartz tourmaline veins. Uh, when we look at this image on the upper right-hand side, it's pretty obvious that there's quartz in there, and that, that gray material is, is tourmaline, but also tourmaline that's been replaced. Little tiny veins in the lower right-hand side, again, um, just millimeter size, and that's a quartz carbonate vein, and other quartz carbonates of vein, and, and pretty intense in that area. So we go on and just look at a few um, polished thin sections, uh, transmitted light, and, and the pairs, so transmitted light, analyzer in, analyzer out. But the importance is, is um, the quartz term, uh, sorry, the quartz carbonate veins. Make sure I hit the right button again. Okay. Here, nice quartz carbonate vein, nice quartz carbonate vein. We'll talk about the importance of that in a minute. And, and quartz carbonate veins here. And the question I have for, for those of you that are a hell of a lot smarter than I am out there, there's, it's not an uncommon feature to see these veins that are oriented in this direction, and the clear crystal growth direction is perpendicular to that in these little tiny narrow veins. So somebody will tell me, yes, it's a pressure-related release. Um, I'm very open to anything that anybody has to add about that. But there's a lot of carbonates in here. And we are doing work now at Adelaide Uni with the methodology that's been developed at Adelaide Microscopy for lutetium hafnium updating of these carbonates, just so we have a better idea. 
so go on. Now we're, we're, we're getting around more to the meat of things, is talk about little petrophysical data, and again, handheld petrophysical measurements. On the upper right-hand diagram just shows the, the, the P-wave velocity uh, going down hole, and there's a little bit of scatter in it because I did it on in modern times on, on pretty old core, but still reasonably well. We can go, go through this, and, and we actually see a kick in the profile. You know, noise, 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 jump up. You know, the zone of deep mineralization comes out pretty well, that, that shadow around it. We look at velocity versus acoustic impedance, because if we're looking at seismic, it, it's acoustic impedance, and, and it's acoustic impedance is, is a function, it's the velocity times really the bulk dry density. So what do we see? The granites and the altered granites along this trend, and as we start adding more iron oxide into the rock, you head up here. These are the bulk of the, the iron-rich breaches are, and this sort of, in order to see this from our seismic experts, tell me that we, that we need to have an acoustic impedance difference of 2.5 to 5 to be able to pick them up on reflection surveys. This is good. So just to, then just a reminder where that velocity also happens to, to coincide where our deep zone of mineralization is. So we'll whip along here. So where are we heading? Um, where we're heading with here, we can see three large fibrosized trucks at Olympic Dam. Uh, we've recently uh, completed a, what we call a sparse 3D survey and with the potential for a full 3D seismic survey during uh, the next calendar year incredibly exciting time. So we've collected the data to actually, and, and have done a lot of pre-modeling to understand what the spacing on that seismic survey needs to be for us to be able to visual, to see uh, features at about 1.5 kilometers depth and greater than that in the deposit. So in conclusion, the deep style mineralization Olympic Dam, there's, there's uh, geochemically distinct moly arsenic 10 tungsten antimony signature to it. The deeps are far, fault bounded, and there is no question about that. There's quartz tourmaline, quartz carbonate, quartz veins over the area within that, that area bounded by Woodall, what we call Woodall and Woodall Junior faults. And that fault offset again is this 2.5 to 3 kilometers. Uh, we know that in a sense, these holes, in order to effectively drill these holes, this area that we need holes that are plus, you know, around 2.5 kilometers and some even longer. Those are expensive, but they are becoming the norm in our industry, particularly as we have to drill deeper and deeper. But we want to see if any kind of remote sensing technique is actually going to help us help us target these areas. We know, and so always the big question in, in sulfide um, in sulfide systems and using geophysics, does geophysics directly detect sulfides? There's been enough work done on the Stewart Shelf and, and, and in IOCGs that the general conclusion is with these iron oxide rich systems that you're actually, the, the various geophysical signatures when you're deep in the deposits are not responding to sulfides, they're responding to the iron oxides. But that's okay because we're in IOCGs. If we see high iron oxides, that's actually a good signature. Um, the hematite breaches in fault contact with the grant in the granite granite breaches um, have enough of a contrast to be picked up by uh, reflection surveys. Uh, the porosity, though, does vary significantly within these breaches, and it does influence the velocity. So sometimes we can have granite breaches that have the same thing as a hematite breach that have 50% iron in them. So, so one number doesn't suit everything. The, v, the velocity contrast in the granite surrounding the deposits, mean going out from that area where I showed you RD2488, which is a fresh rocks redowns granite, doing a transect in toward the breaches, that the velocity contrast isn't enough in those areas up until we're really in the deposit, because for several kilometers out from the edges of the breccia complex, we're really only doing real kind of muscovite alteration that's happening in there, even though there's other precursors of things happening. So, and the final, the final spot is there's more to be presented um, at the Australian Exploration and Geoscience Conference in Brisbane in, in, in 2023. And that hopefully, if I'm invited again for next year at this time, um, we'll have a big imaging of what our, all of our seismic results are. So thank you. Yep.